Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 355, Dr. Stephen Nemish on Trinity Theories, Part 2. In this second half of my wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Stephen Nemish, we explore philosophical or conceptual problems with various Trinity theories. There's a lot of philosophical reasoning in this one, so buckle up. Although, towards the end, we do get into discussing religious persecution versus religious freedom and religious tolerance. Dr. Nemish, welcome back to the Trinity's Podcast. Thanks for having me back. So last week we were going through this epic tweet thread that you did on Twitter about the doctrine of the Trinity and different ways of interpreting it. And in the first part, we discussed some of your opening salvos, that it looks like you run into tritheism if the divine nature is this you know, shareable, universal essence. Whereas if it's a concrete essence, you seem to run into contradictions, that they're saying that there are three things here and that there's one thing here. And uh, in the part in your thread that we're at right now, you suggest a way out of this dilemma. So why don't you take it from there? Sure. So one way out of this dilemma is to take the usia as a concrete instance of a nature, and then to understand the hypostases as modes of subsistence or dimensions of that usia. And this is the kind of answer that you get in, for example, Karl Barth and Karl Rahner, Uh, They say that hypostasis does not mean person in the sense of like a center of consciousness or a self. They think rather that it means a mode of subsistence, a way that something exists. The consequence, of course, is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not denote centers of consciousness or selves or anything like that. These Mm -hmm. are rather uh, three modes in which God subsists, three ways that he exists. Mm. They can be eternal. They can be, you know, simply constitutive of the divine nature so that God is always subsisting in these three ways. Maybe they don't have anything to do with the, you know, salvific economy or whatever. But that's one way to get out of this problem, right? So the problem was that if you define usia as a concrete nature, well, hypostasis means exactly that. So how do you have one concrete nature and three concrete natures? Well, then you redefine hypostasis as a mode of subsistence or a mode of being. Now, the problem with that is that this view does not actually allow you to make certain statements that the Catholic tradition is committed to. For example, either you cannot call the divine being God, or else you cannot call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit God. And the reason why is this. John of Damascus says that typically you cannot apply one and the same name both to a whole and to the parts that constitute that whole. Uh, So, for example, a collection of bricks is not itself a brick, but rather a house or a wall or a pathway or whatever. Uh, Just like a collection of football players is not itself a football player, but rather a team. So when you have things added up, the thing that they make up, the whole, you don't call it by the same name as the parts. So let's say then, for example, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are modes of God's subsistence. Well, they are modes that belong to a whole, which is the divine nature, And so either the whole is God, in which case Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cannot be called God individually, or else Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are called God individually, and you have three gods, but you cannot call the whole God. So the problem with this basically is that you still have this problem of how to preserve Catholic Trinitarian language. How can you say that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but only one God? Now, to me, this looks problematic that you should characterize the Father and Son as modes, because then whenever the Father speaks to the Son or vice versa, you basically have God in one mode talking to himself in another mode. So you have just fundamentally God talking to himself, which doesn't seem right. But a person might say uh, modes are, by definition, not supposed to be things, so they shouldn't count as parts. They're just like aspects or something. Mm -hmm. So if you say, you know, there's three modes to this diamond, it's uh, mass, it's hardness, it's luminosity. Right. Those aren't parts of the diamond. It's just three aspects of it. Right. So what if somebody said something like that? I think that it doesn't matter because I'm not using the word thing or whatever in, in the sense of like a separate existence. I'm just talking about 
for me in this discussion right now, a thing is something that you can refer to as individually okay. in, in separation from everything else. Just absolute bare bones conception, something of some kind. Yes, exactly. And when you have this differentiation between a whole and its parts, now this doesn't have to be like a material whole and its material parts. It can be the difference between, for example, a cat and its shape and its biological species, right? So the cat, in some sense, is sort of the whole to which all these things belong. But you can look at particular dimensions of the cat and say, well, its shape is like this, its weight is like this, its species is like this. Uh, you're talking about different aspects of the cat that are uh, can be differentiated from one another and that all together somehow combine and form the cat or constitute the cat. Okay. The same thing holds, right? Mm -hmm. So the cat has various dimensions, but the whole cat is not a dimension, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The cat is a substance, but the various dimensions making up the cat are not themselves substances. So right. the principle still holds that you cannot call the whole by the same name as you would call the individual parts. And so that means that if the divine usia is called God, then Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not properly called God, uh, or vice versa. I don't understand why there would be that rule of naming. I mean, if Angry Dale was a mode of Dale, you might call Angry Dale Dale. Mm -hmm. Well, so when you talk about Angry Dale, you are including sort of substance and accident together in a single phrase, Angry mm -hmm. Dale. Yes. That's a little different than talking about Dale's anger. Because there, you're not referring to the substance and the accident together. You're referring, strictly speaking, to the accident. Okay. Um, so what I'm doing in this argument is I'm referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit specifically as modes of the divine usia that are presumably distinct from one another because otherwise you wouldn't have an actual trinity. Well, because they're you know on the level of mode, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct from one another. Now, they are the modes of the divine usia, but referring to them individually, either they take the title of God or not. And if they do, that means that the whole cannot. And furthermore, it would mean that there are, strictly speaking, three gods because there are three modes. Why couldn't the name God just be ambiguous between meaning a god or the god and mm -hmm. just modes of a god? We just put another entry in the dictionary. Well, maybe the name God could be ambiguous in that way, but... Once we disambiguate it, we find out that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not God in the same sense that the divine Usia is God. Mm. And this raises all sorts of problems because then you think to yourself, okay, well, what is the affirmation of monotheism? In what sense does Christian theology have to be a monotheism? We can't just make up whatever sense we want. Presumably, we have to try to be faithful to our sources. We also have to think, okay, these people who were first struggling with this issue of Trinitarian theology, what did they understand by monotheism? How did they define it? Mm-hmm. And once you disambiguate things, then the rule will apply once more. If there is this distinction between the three modes of subsistence of the divine usia, then either those things can be called God and there are three gods, or else only the divine usia is properly called God, in which case Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not gods, or not each properly called God. It would seem to me that the central use of the term God would be to refer to a God. <laughs> but that would only be the divine usia, Right. Right. The divine usia would be God, but that means that its modes are not properly called God. So you could not yeah. say that the Son is God. The Son yeah. is a mode of God. It's a weird fit with the New Testament, too, in that it's almost always the Father being called God, and then in a few instances, also the Son. But then that sits poorly with this, it seems to me. It seems like the word God should be mostly reserved for the divine usia and not for any of the persons, if this theology is right. Yeah, the problem is that Trinitarian theology, the more it tries to make sense of itself, the absolute further it gets from the New Testament's way of speaking. And that's because probably there is no doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You can tell how far you're getting away from the New Testament when you no longer use anything like the same language, you no longer express yourself in the same way. Mm. You run into all these theoretical problems where you think, oh, well, this is not really a, a very Trinitarian way of speaking that the New Testament is proposing here. Once you see that you are talking in a way that you just simply cannot find in the New Testament sources, that is evidence enough, I think, that you are so far away theoretically from the New Testament that you're talking about something else altogether now. Well, it's okay. They are primitive theologians, <laughs> and we are advanced. They're just caveman theologians, and we are modern man now. You can always say that somebody who talks different <laughs> from you is on his way to where you are. Right. Uh, but yeah. then you can always say that, no, actually, you've just gone away from the other person. So that's right. That, you know, it's like, are you going uphill or downhill? It really, you know, it's, it's a matter of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Good point.
when the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Nemish brings up the difficult doctrine of divine simplicity. The next tweet in your thread, you suggest, since you're raising a problem about speaking loosely of parts and holes, Mm -hmm. not in the strict sense, but in the sense of a thing and its three modes, which I guess will be essential to it, you say there's a traditional speculation here that might be brought into play. Tell us about this doctrine of divine simplicity and how someone might apply it to this type of problem in theology. Well, briefly stated, the doctrine of divine simplicity states that God is not composite in any of the ways that finite beings are composite. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has no mode of composition that would imply finitude or limitation on his part or the need of a cause. So that means that he's obviously not physically composite. He's not composed of a body that can be broken up. But in its more radical statements, which I think are its more honest statements, ultimately it means that there is not in God a distinction between essence and existence or uh, subject and accident or like Thomas Aquinas says uh, nature and supposit basically the idea is that God is this pure undifferentiated actuality he is not an instance of something he is simply pure being pure undifferentiated actuality and only thus can he be the cause and the ultimate source of everything that is composite and so everything therefore that requires a cause, requires something to explain the unity of its constituent parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's true that the doctrine of divine simplicity was more or less taken for granted by all the participants in the early Trinitarian debates. You really find this doctrine in all kinds of different world religions, but it was very prominent, especially in the Greek philosophical notion of God, and especially the Platonic one. The problem with this is that even though the early Trinitarian theologians constantly made reference to the doctrine of divine simplicity to try to understand how there can be one God and so on. It's not obvious that they are not abusing the doctrine in their theologizing, right? So somebody can say, well, it's true, you know, the hypostases are modes of subsistence, but however, this, you know, we have to remember that God is absolutely simple. And so he's not composed by these modes. There's no composition. Well, at this point, it seems to me like people are just contradicting themselves. They either want the Trinitarian theology or they want divine simplicity, but you can't really have it both ways. They use, it seems to me, divine simplicity to ward off some of the undesirable consequences of their Trinitarian postulations. But it's not really principled, because if you're really committed to a doctrine of divine simplicity, you have to do away with all notion of of differentiation within God whatsoever. Yeah. So it, it seems to me like divine simplicity is a useful tool that they bring in when it's convenient, and then they put it away when it becomes inconvenient. I think that's fair. The ordinary layperson, Dr. Nemish, I think has a real hard time even conceiving what divine simplicity is. Let me give a crude analogy. So imagine that you know you believe in God, and God is this, say, pincushion. God has you know a bunch of different qualities. He's uh, wise. Put a pin in the cushion. He's loving. Put another pin in the cushion. He's he's necessary in his existence. He's eternal. Right. So you can just keep adding probably dozens of pins to this pin cushion. You know, God on the face of it is a rather complex reality and rather unlike uh, the ordinary things that we deal with right. in various ways. Okay. But if divine simplicity is true, then anything that's intrinsic to God just is God. It's identical to God. So, you know, erase the pin cushion and shrink that down to a point in classical geometry. Just a location. It has no breadth or length or depth. It's just, it's just, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's divine simplicity. <laughs> there is no, you can't distinguish between different divine attributes. You can't distinguish between God and his attributes. It just takes any kind of complexity that a person might think is there and just collapses it down to that point. Right. And, you know, 
the way I summarize Trinitarian theologies is that the one God is tripersonal, and that's obviously supposed to be intrinsic and essential to God, but then that would be a distinction in God. So it looks like that would have to get collapsed, and um, even his different pieces of knowledge all get collapsed, and it, it really look, starts to look incoherent, as our mutual friend, Dr. Ryan Mullins, has argued in many ways. Right. It's hard to see how it's even consistent with God being a trinity, much less that it's going to help. I certainly agree with you. I think that, you know, like I said, the early theologians appealed to divine simplicity when it was convenient for them and their Trinitarian speculating. And then when it was inconvenient for them, they put the doctrine away. Now, notably, their Trinitarian speculating mostly is drawn from Scripture, whereas the idea of divine simplicity is sort of a part of the philosophical milieu of their time. And, yeah. you know, Latter day Platonism, who, Neoplatonism. There are people who are trying to argue that there's a case for classical theism in the Bible, but I just think it's, it's highly implausible. I think what happens is that they end up over-interpreting certain verses and, you know, they say, well, we have a doctrine of creation in the Bible. And if you think about the consequences of what that means for a really long time, you'll get to the doc. You know, it's mm-hmm. like basically the Bible, I think, certainly gives us a notion of God and the world and all ev- all other things as standing in a relation of an asymmetrical relation of dependence. It's true that God is the source of everything else. Everything else depends on him. He doesn't depend on anything else himself. That's true, but that's a purely formal fact. And when you take that formal fact and f- fit it into a particular philosophical system, it'll look different. So the doctrine of divine simplicity, classical metaphysics, that's one system for understanding this relation between God and the world. But it's possible to develop alternative systems which do not have a doctrine of the divine simplicity, but nevertheless affirm and maintain the asymmetrical relation of dependence that occurs between God and the world. So I'm not convinced at all that there is a case for divine simplicity in Scripture, and it seems to me that the use of the doctrine of divine simplicity in Trinitarian theorizing is either highly selective or else just makes things nearly impossible to understand. Yeah, we might just mention in conclusion that some philosophically aware theologians just simply deny any traditional divine simplicity doctrine. They might say that God doesn't have parts in the way that like a physical object have parts, but they think there's lots of other complexity in God, like having different properties, for instance, div- different divine right. perfections. There's also a cottage industry amongst uh, contemporary theologians of basically redefining simplicity so it's not so radical and so, they'll, hey, look, Gregory of Nazianzus says this, but he also says this, so clearly he must have a looser definition of simplicity. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, some of us are like, well, that's you're kind of not getting the whole motivation of divine simplicity once you start weakening it. Right. Because the, the idea was that to be ultimate, you just can't have any complexity because that would imply some kind of dependence or something. Right. There's this weird sort of conservatism in a lot of theology where people feel the need to hold on to certain terms because they're classical and traditional and this is you know the terms that people use even though they redefine the ideas uh, i think mm. this happens in trinitarian theology you cannot tell me for example that jürgen moltmann and uh, richard swinburne for example are properly called trinitarians when their own doctrine of the trinity looks nothing like thomas aquinas or a lot of these other figures you know, they're just tritheists. They're called Trinitarians because, you know, they're concerned with developing a doctrine of the Trinity. But at this point, the doctrine of the Trinity, that word doesn't mean anything anymore. If Karl Rahner and Barth and Moltmann and Swinburne equally count as Trinitarians, even though their conceptions of God couldn't be further apart. People in theology want to use the same words. For whatever reason, it's sort of looked down upon in theology to start using different words and to speak about things differently. But what happens is that you have the same word and it just becomes undefinable. And then there's a problem of, well, it depends on what you mean by divine simplicity. It depends on what you mean by apostasis. It depends on what you mean by usia. And mm-hmm. then you just get these problems where, you know, words become endlessly definable in a thousand different ways because nobody wants to just use a different word. Yeah. When somebody says this doctrine contradicts that doctrine, you can always just redefine one of the doctrines and get out of it. Yeah. Which is, you know, these are just word games at that point. We're no longer talking about anything concrete. We're just you know, finding ways of saving our, our, our preferred modes of speaking, mm. which I think is, is personally an empty, uh, an empty project. Well, Dr. Nemish, in your tweet thread, you suggest another way out at your point number four here. Why don't you talk us through that? Sure. So here was the original problem 
if we distinguish between the usia as the divine being, the concrete nature, and the hypostasis as the modes of subsistence of that nature, then we have the problem that you cannot call the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit God if you're going to call the usia God, the divine nature. Well, one way out of this problem is to identify God with the Father. So, you know, just like in the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say, no, God is the Father. Okay, so that's our starting point. We call God the Father. Now, the problem is this. Okay, if God is the Father, then presumably he is to be identified with the divine Usia, which is also properly called God. Mm -hmm. But in that point, okay, how are the Son and the Holy Spirit distinct hypostases then? from the Father, because that if the Father is identified with the Divine Usia, the Son and the Holy Spirit presumably come from the Father, that means, you know, they are not identified with the Divine Usia, because otherwise they would already be there, there would be no need for a procession. In that case, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not hypostasis in the same way as the Father. There's an equivocation going on here, because the Father is there first, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not there first, all right? So even if all this procession takes place eternally and timelessly, you know, from the point of view of logical or ontological priority, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not there first, just the Father is. And then they proceed from the Father, or, or they're begotten by the Father, or whatever. The Father is identified with the Divine Usia directly. The Son and the Holy Spirit can't be identified with the Divine Usia, because otherwise they would already be there, there would be no need for a procession, so they proceed from the Father. Well, you know, at this point, the Father is an hypostasis in one sense, and the Son and the Holy Spirit are hypostasis in a different sense. So now you just have an equivocation. You do not have three three persons or three hypostases in the same exact sense. Yeah, and the Father would be God, most properly speaking, and then the Son and Spirit would be, in a way, demoted to something less than that. Right. Ways the one God is or something. And in your tweet, you mentioned, uh, you say, just as a man's self-conception and self-love are not each a man, this is a analogy, I think they would say a bad analogy, which is famously in uh, Augustine's voluminous speculations on this topic. Maybe the Trinity is like a mind or a thinker or a person, his knowledge and his love, like for mm -hmm. himself. But then, yeah, it seems like you only have one being there. So you'd only have one God who is, you know, enjoying these mental actions or something like that, or right. mental qualities. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be in the spirit of Trinitarian theorizing. Yeah, it certainly it undermines the equality of the hypostasis if one of them is properly speaking a concrete nature, a thing, and the other one end up, you know, the other two just end up being dimensions or modes of that thing. You know, it's, you're not really talking about three hypostasis in the same sense any longer. So once more, the, the coherence of the Trinitarian language is undermined. Yeah. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what about so-called social Trinitarianism? Now, it seems to me, Dr. Nemish, that in the 1800s, there was kind of a rediscovery of the human Jesus and a lot of renewed interest in wanting a Jesus who is truly human and not just who appears like one. And similarly, it seems to me in the second half of the 20th century, there was a discovery amongst Trinitarians or a remembering of the interpersonal relationship between the Father and the Son. So, you know, they cooperate, they love each other. The son prays to the father, the father speaks back and guides him. He shows the son everything he's doing and so on. And mm -hmm. so it looks like you need at least two of the three persons of the Trinity to be really persons or selves so that they can enjoy this interpersonal relationship. Sometimes this is called social Trinitarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what you move on to next. So why not go in that direction? Well, um, the first thing to say is that there are a number of scholars who 
argue and readily admit that this is not what the word hypostasis meant in ancient discourse. This is a controverted point. Some people are, are not so convinced by it. But Karl Barth and Karl Rahner, for example, are adamant that the term hypostasis in ancient uh, Trinitarian discourse does not mean a self in the sense of a center of self-awareness, you know, that's the subject of its own experiences and actions, something that experiences itself and wills and wants and thinks and so on. Um, it meant the mode of subsistence, a way that something exists. Well, if that's true, then this, you know, introducing distinct centers of consciousness into the doctrine of the Trinity is just, you know, a novel, a novel um, proposal. It's, it's, this is not what the original Trinitarians were talking about, but we can leave that point to the side. We still have to ask the question of how the divine usia and these three persons, these three centers of consciousness, how do they relate to each other? Is the usia prior to the centers of consciousness? Like, for example, some people think that our consciousness is produced by our brains. So our, our non sort of pre, you know, physical brain, pre-conscious brain, once it's, you know, gets up and running, it, it's alive, it interacts with its environment, then you have our conscious experience produced, uh, like a kind of a movie that is projected by this brain somehow. Well, if the three persons, the three selves, are produced by the divine usia, then you have to do away totally with the notion of eternal processions, because all of them equally come from the divine usia. It's not that the Father comes from the Son and the Holy Spirit from the Son, or at, you know, from the Father, or else from the Father and the Son. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together are emergent out of this divine usia. Mm. Uh, so they all equally have their origins in the divine usia. This also means there's no real reason why you should call two of them father and son because they're not, they don't have a, you know, that sort of a relation to one another. One is not the origin of the other. So this also means that at this point, it's not even obvious why the Bible should have spoken of God, the father and the son using those terms because the one is not the origin of the other. They are both originated from the divine usia. I think I'm missing something here. A person like Swinburne, for instance, yeah. He makes a big deal about the divine processions. He thinks, uh, given that there's one divine person, there have to be exactly three divine persons. Mm -hmm. And it happens by something like eternal generation and procession. Why right. is it that you think a, a person who believes in the members of the Trinity as three subjects of consciousness or selves, why can't they believe in processions? Just because the usia is explanatorily prior or metaphysically prior to them? Yes, if the usia, so it's a conditional argument. If you grant that the usia is explanatorily prior to the persons, so that the persons emerge out of the usia or whatever, then strictly speaking, all of them are originated. None of them are unoriginated. Right? So even the father would be originated by the divine usia. He would emerge from the divine usia, which is, of course, contrary to the traditional Trinitarian point that the father alone is unoriginated. The second point would be that because Father and Son and Holy Spirit all equally emerge out of the divine usia, there's no reason why the Father and the Son should be called that, because the one isn't dependent on the other. They're both emergent from the usia. But even if you say that the Father first emerges from the usia and then he brings about the Son and the Spirit himself, it's still true that the Father would be originated. He would not be unoriginated. He would be emergent from the divine usia, and that's contrary to Trinitarian theologizing. Hmm. Yeah, I think this would work against some of these three self-Trinitarians, not others. I don't think Swinburne has the divine usia as a prior thing. I think he thinks properties are just to be understood as concepts or something. So mm -hmm. what's primary for him is just the Father. Right. And of course, our concept of divinity applies to him. But there definitely are other Trinitarians who are more traditional, who seem to be thinking that there is a divine usia that is eternally, necessarily, essentially manifesting, so to speak, or giving rise to these three beings, however you want to put it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, of course, some of them embrace denying the divine processions, right? Right. They deny it because it has no support in the Bible, which I agree with, uh, but they also deny it because they think it would make the Son and Spirit less than fully divine because they exist because of the Father. Mm -hmm. Well, then the question is, why are two of them called Father and Son if they don't have a relation of origin relative to one another? Yeah, I think they would probably just bite the bullet and say, that's just what Scripture says. One of them is the Father, one of them is the Son, so we just use those names. Well, what Scripture says is, you are my son today, I have begotten you, right? So the, the motivation that Scripture provides for that 
difference in naming is that one is made son by the other. You can interpret this as an eternal procession. You can interpret this as an adoption. You can interpret it however. But what you cannot do is say that father and son are just called that for whatever reason, because scripture actually gives you a reason. One is made son by the other. So I think that, you know, you can des- you can deny the eternal processions. That's fine. But it's still true that you have no reason to call one father and the other son, whereas scripture does provide you a reason, uh, namely that the one is made son by the father. So either this refers to, again, either this refers to an eternal procession or also refers perhaps to the adoption of Christ at at his baptism through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or whatever. But in any case, one is made son by the other. It's Mm -hmm. not true that scripture just uses these titles without any explanation. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And of course, uh, if you go back to the psalm that they're quoting there, is probably something like a coronation psalm, wasn't it, for King of Israel? Yes. So, yes, it's not reproduction, but it is the king being granted this status, son of God by God, in virtue mm-hmm. of his being king, I guess, over God's chosen people. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, at, at bare minimum, the father son analogy or metaphor, whatever it is, suggests that the son depends on the father for his status or or existence or something. Right. They'll just have to say it's like functional or something like the person's just, you know, eternally decided to cooperate in a certain way and that this one would be in charge. So they just call him father because that's like a hierarchical position of authority. You can say that, but there is no language whatsoever in scripture that justifies that. I mean, at, at this point, it seems to me we're just so far from what scripture says and from what the historic Trinitarian tradition says that you're off in your own land. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think like if you have any conservative spirit in you at all, you don't want to, you know, invent new mythologies and new, uh, you know, pre-creational stories about how these titles came about. I, I think that this yeah. is so speculative. It's, it's, it just becomes unconvincing after a point. Yeah. And any passage that you could try to construe as having to do with divine persons in eternity before creation or something like that, it's only going to have the two persons. It's never going to have the third one. Right. And so you just don't get this pre-story of you know these three sitting down together, so to speak, uh, or just an eternity deciding to have a certain policy. Like it's, there's just no materials for it. Right. I agree. I think that's a dead end. I've called this before the problem of the missing amigo. <laughs> <laughs> the three amigos, you know. Yeah. Social Trinitarians talk a big game about how beautiful this picture is, about there's this eternal dance of love. And it's like three people, like, you know, dancing ring around the rosy, jumping up and down together for a turn. And this is just a perfect picture of what perfect love is and so on. But you get this relationship between father and son. And it, okay, there's a few passages you could argue have to do with, you know, before the creation of the world or something, but you only get two amigos. Right. You're just making up this just so story because you think it sounds really cool, but it seems like it's not really well motivated. We talked a little bit about this last time, but I think in theology, you can get away with so much that in any other field of inquiry would be laughed off as ridiculous. The standards of rigor in theology are entirely misplaced. People can just take for granted, you know, like what we're talking about now, this picture of God. It's as if people forget that theology starts with the interpretation of scripture. Mm. That's what every theologian from the beginning of the Christian church was doing, was interpreting scripture and trying to make sense of it. And then you get these theological systems that develop and they become more predominant over time. And then the ideas in these systems become more interesting than the text themselves. And then, you know, the text just become a a means for, you know, finding images or or brief, you know, suggestive little uh, passages that can help to bring out an idea or an, an aspect of the idea that you're so enamored with. And you start ending up with something that looks nothing like what is in the New Testament. And you start talking in ways that bears no resemblance whatsoever to the way that Peter or Paul or James or John spoke. Or sometimes even the mainstream tradition too, you know? like Yeah, exactly. W- one of these that blows me away that I, I encounter all the time is what I think is a very recent idea that God himself, in order to show sympathy and solidarity with our suffering— that God himself suffered and died. They think this helps somehow with the problem of evil because God's suffering from it too. Mm -hmm. And it kind of blows my mind because not only is it not a New Testament theme at all, 
but it's something that the mainstream tradition would have just laughed off because they think God can't suffer. Yeah, and he certainly can't feel <laughs> he certainly can't feel pity for us and you know submit himself to suffering for that reason because the divine nature is impassable. He is unaffected. All the bad things that happen in the world, God strictly speaking, in his divinity is unaffected. It doesn't disturb him at all. You know, of course, people like Jurgen Moltmann who who have this idea, they not only propose this idea that God suffers out of solidarity with us, but they also reject the classical idea of God as being heartless or cruel or simply unbelievable, you know, in the post-Holocaust world. Mm -hmm. So it, admittedly, like at least some of these persons are conscious that they're going beyond the Catholic tradition and they're even conscious in, in rejecting it. Yeah, that's right. Some of these ideas start that way. And then once they get released into the wild, now a person comes along and seems to think that this has kind of been the whole point of the tradition all along, that God is so sympathetic to us that he suffers and dies along with us. Right. And that, that's the part that blows my mind, because it's just so disconnected from the actual history of theology. Right. It's extremely right. recent, you know. It's like this eternal dance of love, same thing. When the Trinity's podcast returns... Dr. Nemesh asks, what if the Trinitarian says that the divine nature, or usia, is coeval with the three divine persons? Okay, in your next tweet, you say, alternatively, one may say that the divine nature is co-evil with the three centers of consciousness rather than producing them. And then mm -hmm. you say, but then we're back to the same dialectic, either three gods or I would say, well, maybe four because the nature might be a god and then each of these three, right. or else Father, Son, and Spirit are but parts or modes of God, not God himself. You want God himself to be in there somewhere. Right. When you say that the divine nature is coeval or sort of on the same level, you know, simultaneous with, but distinct from the three centers of consciousness, then again, you have this problem. Either you have four things there, you have the nature and then the three centers of consciousness, and they're all sort of on a par, or else you want to say somehow that the one nature is the three centers of consciousness. And then once more, you know, it's the same dialectic. It's the same problem of how is, how is, how are three things one thing? You know, either the one thing is an abstract nature that they instantiate, then you have three gods, or the one thing is a concrete nature, but how do you have a single concrete nature and, and three centers of consciousness? Does the concrete nature produce the centers of consciousness? We're back to the previous problem. Uh, is the concrete nature on the same ontological level as the centers of consciousness? Well, now you have four things there. You know, is the concrete nature somehow the collection of the three of them together? Well, then either the collection is called God and not the three persons, or else each person is called God, but you have three gods. There are these fundamental, these, these formal problems, basically, with trying to put one thing in relation to three things. This is really the essence of the issue. If you want to put one term in relation to three terms, there are only so many ways you can do that. And no matter what way you try to do it, you run into the problem of saying something that the Catholic tradition has to reject. So generally, the issue is this. There simply is no way, formally speaking, there is no way to put one term in relation to three terms in order to get a coherent notion that is simultaneously compatible with what the Catholic tradition wants to say and other dogmatic commitments that it might have. Now, what would you say if somebody offered a defense like this? Yes, I see the problems that you're pointing out, and I admit that it's hard to find a consistent set of claims here. But, hey, God is transcendent, and therefore we're only going to have a very tenuous grasp of God and why can't we just say that God is one in one sense and God is three in another sense? And well, we can't, we can't exactly say what those senses are, but I mean, that's just the sort of thing we should expect when dealing with a transcendent being, right? That our mind's going to get hung up on this kind of antimony. Mm -hmm. 
There are a few things that I would say, I suppose, in response to this kind of uh, Mysterian position. The first thing that I would say is, why are you so committed to this way of speaking <laughs> that you're willing to just throw your hands up and admit that you don't even know what you're saying, but you still have to try to say it? Why are you so committed to this? Well, somebody can say, well, this is what the church teaches or this is what scripture teaches. Are you really so sure that the church demands or that the, that the scriptures rather demand that you say those things? The three essential, you know, Trinitarian sentences, Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God, there's only one God, Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit, etc. Those precise formulations that are basically like commonly propagated for understanding the Trinitarian doctrine, what's so fascinating is that you do not find those sentences in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So you think that these sentences are supposed to help make sense of Scripture. Okay, well, first of all, you don't know what you're saying. You admit that you don't know what you're saying or what sense to make out of all this doctrine. Also, the very sentences that you think you have to use, those sentences do not appear in Scripture. And in the third place, how, do you, how can you make sense of Scripture with something that you don't know what it is? So if you cannot even coherently and intelligibly formulate Trinitarian doctrine, how is it that you can use it to make sense of Scripture? What are you using to make sense of Scripture? At the end of the day, you have to think, okay, you, you think that you have to have a doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, that's fine. Tell me which doctrine. Is it the social Trinitarianism? Are the three hypostases modes of God's uh, being? Mm -hmm. Do you have like a single nature with three centers of con Like which, which Trinitarian doctrine are you using? Relative identity. Which one of these are you using to make sense of Scripture? Okay, if you, as soon as you pick one, then we run into all the same logical problems we've been discussing now for two hours, right? As soon yeah. as you pick one of these theories, then you have a bunch of logical problems and you think, well, okay, I can't do that. But if you're not picking any particular theory, then you're not actually offering a Trinitarian reading of scripture. You just, you, you know, because you can't even stipulate what is the Trinity exactly. It's like saying, I'm giving a Marxist reading of, you know, a Marxist interpretation of a certain movie, but I can't tell you what Marxism is. Mm. I'm just using a word at that point. I'm not actually doing anything intelligible. I'm just calling my reading by a certain title. And this gets back to what we were talking about last week. Why are people so concerned about using this language? Because really, Trinity is a shibboleth. It's not a, a single coherent idea that can be made sense of and that has an intelligible content. It's a shibboleth. It's a way that you show that you belong to a certain group, specifically a particularly intolerant faction of historic Christianity that eventually came to predominate and that exiled and excommunicated and burnt its theological enemies alive at the stake and asserted its unique right to interpret scripture and to demand that Christians believe this or that. Basically, you know, the insistence on using Trinitarian language, even while admitting that you don't know what the Trinity means, is just a shibboleth. It's just a way of showing your allegiance to a particular group. It is not actually like affirming anything intelligible because as soon as you try to make sense of it, you run into problems. Can I comment on something you said there about religious freedom? Go ahead. This is something that really surprises and bothers me about contemporary Protestantism. Protestants have lost all sort of offense against Roman Catholic claims. In modern times, we take religious freedom for granted, not realizing that for the majority of Christian history, there was no religious freedom, because as soon as orthodoxy closed ranks in 381, they immediately started to clamp down on the pagans, but also on any Christians who didn't go along with the whole Nicene program. Right. And that was the end of religious freedom, because church and state were all bound up together. Right. And you didn't have any religious freedom in the Christian world until Protestants like John Locke reinvented it in early modern times. Now, God bless them, I'm very glad that the Roman Catholics have lately discovered religious freedom. I think that basically happened in America in the 1800s, although I'm not quite sure how that big change went down. So now you have Roman Catholics who, I guess they needed religious freedom, right? Being a minority in America. Yeah. And they came to think, hey, this is a great thing. Everybody should have religious freedom, right? Whereas before they were the gleeful persecutors and murderers of... <laughs> Right. Not all Catholics, but Catholic regimes, you know, were responsible for countless deaths, you know, that were doctrinally motivated. I just wish people remember these things is my main point. You really have to be, I think, a part of a minority group to appreciate these things. A lot of people just feel themselves to be a part of a majority culture. And whenever you are, 
you don't see any problem with, you know, enforcing your point of view and thinking, well, everybody should think this way. You know, everybody should be like us. It's only when you're a minority and when people are trying to force their opinion on you and you don't agree with it and you think they're wrong, but they won't listen to anything that you say and they threaten to kill you if, <laughs> unless you agree with them. You have to be in that minority position to really appreciate what religious freedom means. And when mm -hmm. people begin to step into a majority position, well, then they begin to take up attitudes of contempt towards people who disagree and they take themselves for granted because they're the majority. Everybody thinks like them. They can express their opinions freely. No one's going to get on their case. But when you're in a minority position and you, you cannot express your opinions freely without running the risk of people leaving you or abandoning you or calling you names or doing worse to you, then you really appreciate the value of a principle like religious toleration at the, you know, at the macro level. The Catholic tradition is not a tolerant tradition of Christianity. It was not from the very beginning. From the very beginning, the Catholic tradition was always intolerant, unwilling to consider an alternative viewpoint, always on the hunt for heresies to, you know, to weed out. It always took its own point of view for granted. It always says, we are clearly right. We won't listen to any arguments. It always tended in the direction of there's absolutely no salvation outside of this bishop-led church. Right. You know, sort of the right. cult like, uh, like the JWs, like we are the one true church. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, so I, I, I think that, that. The, the Catholic tradition is just a particularly intolerant faction of Christianity. It had its heyday in the Reformation. It started to break apart. To some extent, there were still elements of the Catholic mentality in certain Protestant groups. Other Protestant oh, groups yeah. managed to break away from it some more. Mm -hmm. If there's anything that can qualify me, I suppose, as a theologian, is that I call myself a post-Catholic theologian. I think Christianity has to move beyond this Catholic period and this Catholic mentality in various ways. And religious toleration, religious tolerance is one principal issue where I think the Catholic tradition simply has been wrong for a very long time and done a lot of harm and evil. Yeah, but they, you know, today you don't have Catholics killing Protestants, so... I mean, I think right, they've so, kind of, they've co-opted it from the Protestants, basically. I should make it clear, when I say Catholic, I don't mean Roman Catholic. I mean yeah. small case C, you know, just, you know, Catholic. So I don't mean specifically Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. I mean Catholic in the sense that includes even some forms of Protestantism. The Orthodox in their own countries, I'm not sure, ever have discovered religious freedom. Don't they claim a monopoly in places like Russia and Greece? Well, even in my, you know, in my family's own country in Romania, the, yeah. the, the majority of the country is Orthodox. Everybody else is a cult, right? Yeah, everybody else is a cult or a sect. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you know, in my family, being Pentecostals, they were sectarians or whatever. You know, their mm -hmm. whole life, the Pentecostalism was called a sect. Things are changing a little bit because Romania is starting to westernize and liberalize a bit. So attitudes between religious groups in Romania are changing, but certainly historically, Romania is Orthodox. If you're a Romanian, you're an Orthodox. If you're not an Orthodox, you're an apostate. You know, not only have you yeah. left the faith, you've left your country, you're not even a Romanian anymore. That's yes, it's like that in Russia. I mean, you to be a good Russian, you must be Orthodox. Like, they are just bound up as one unit. Right. You're betraying your country if you're not Orthodox. These are just idolatries. Admittedly for me, there is something, an, an existential factor here, that the majority Christianity for so long can be so wrong. <laughs> the majority view of Christianity for so long in history could have been so wrong and so absolutely mistaken in, in, in a lot of things. Now, that doesn't mean that Christianity died or that there was, you know, the church disappeared from the face of the earth for 800 years or 1800 years or whatever. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that. That's obviously false. Mm -hmm. There were always Christians on the earth. There were always people within the Catholic tradition who genuinely loved Christ. I agree. But, you know, once you start to think like this, you have to think, okay, God really grants people the freedom to make mistakes. And he's not going to jump in at, at the first sight of trouble and, and save you from trouble. People can make mistakes. Things can go wrong. The majority can be wrong. The wrong side can have control of things for a very long time. And, you know, to some extent, it motivates action. When you see that God is not going to jump in and save you from the slightest trouble, you know, as soon as it, it shows its face, it motivates action. It motivates awareness. If things are going to go well, we have to do well. If things are going to go well, we have to sort of take responsibility for ourselves and do the right thing and think carefully and try to be just and upright and fair. Now we're moving in an entirely different direction. But basically my point is that, you know, as we started from the beginning, I think people are so concerned to maintain the term Trinity or talk about Trinity, etc., because it's a shibboleth. They want to show their allegiance to this particular faction of Christian theology, which anathematizes and condemns to hell and ex excommunicates and calls you a heretic, even though by its own admission, it doesn't know what it's saying. 
This is the most fascinating line from Karl Rahner when he says, the Trinity is an absolute mystery that we don't understand even after it's been revealed. Now, how can you have revelation that you don't understand? It seems like if it's revealed, it has to be intelligible. But leave that to the side. The Catholic tradition itself admits that it doesn't know what it's saying, but at the same time, if you refuse to go along with it, it calls you a heretic or it sets you on fire or whatever. I don't know what to call it. I just think it's so obviously evil and irrational. This is what bothers me when a person gets theological education and are basically told that, hey, we put our best minds together. You know, all these ingenious men for so long, uh, they all came up with the same type of thing. And, you know, it's just ridiculous that any joker is going to come along now with any kind of different idea and undo this mighty, glorious consensus. When the Trinity's podcast returns, was there a 4th century Christian consensus about the doctrine of the Trinity? This brings me to your last tweet, and maybe this is a good place for us to end our conversation. Feel free to comment on this, obviously. In your tweet, you have an imaginary objector saying, this is the judgment the church has come to about revelation, end quote. And then you say, yes, except for all those other Christians whose churches were confiscated and who were excluded or even killed for dissenting. Consensus by exclusion and coercion is not a genuine rational consensus. Right. You dig into the history of the famous so-called Arian controversy. Yeah, exactly. Historically, we just got Athanasius' hyper-partisan account of all of this, which, you know, I'm grateful for all the information that Athanasius gave us, but he is not exactly an objective observer here. (laughs) Right. So anyway, what we now know, and I think there's a consensus about this, is that In 381, by no means did most people think that the Nicene arguments had just swept the field and were just simply convincing. You had this boiling, roiling controversy still going on. People like Eunomius and others running around saying, no, we're just as convinced as ever that Nicene theology isn't going to work. And this was forcibly shut down by the emperor and what's now called the Second Ecumenical Council. And then they enforced orthodoxy, right? They literally seized churches from bishops who were not part of that consensus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, don't tell me that we all had a great discussion and came to some kind of consensus about it when the discussion was literally cut short by force. Right. Wolfhard Pannenberg, in his Systematic Theology, in the first volume, the chapter on method, This is where I get this line about coercion, right? He says, coercion is entirely out of place in matters of religious belief, and a consensus accomplished by means of religious coercion is not a genuine consensus. And he's referring specifically to these ecumenical councils. I think people are oftentimes just, either they're ignorant or else they're they're just oblivious. You know, how can you say, for example, that the church came to this conclusion when literally Christians were excluding other Christians and say, okay, you're no longer part of the church because you disagree with us. Why? Right. You know, yeah. just because you say so? That's one way to win an argument, I guess, but it's not really winning. Yeah. I gave this example to my students once in, in a philosophy class. I said, let's say half of you are on of one opinion and half of you are of the other opinion, you know, and we have this problem. And I say, okay, you over here, you you all who believe X, get out of this classroom. You're no longer members of the classroom. And I say, oh, look at this. I've accomplished a unity. We're all agreed. <laughs> right? I haven't, I haven't achieved that consensus. That's not a consensus. Yeah, and the next day you say the half that are left, look, we all decided this. We don't need to raise this anymore. Uh. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, it's irrational. I don't know how people... This is, you know, speculative, obviously, but my opinion is that there are just other things at work in all this talk. And you see people on the internet reasoning like this all the time, you know, young, depressed teenagers or, you know, 20-somethings who convert to Catholicism or Orthodoxy and they become like hyper-traditional, more than people in Orthodox countries. Oh, yeah. 
I think these people just have some sort of psychological need that is being met by this extremely intolerant religion that they've adopted. But it's not rational. You cannot tell me that it's rational um, because to return now to this topic of the doctrine of the Trinity, no, it seems to me the hardest thing to have a, an actual coherent discussion about with the person is the doctrine of the Trinity or the incarnation. If you question it at all, if you push it, like they throw out all arguments, they don't actually engage with any of your arguments, they don't present counter arguments, they just call you names, they call you a heretic, they call you this or that, they they mock you, it's all rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what it's like. I want to be clear at this point, in case anybody is out there wondering, oh, well, Stephen is rejecting the Trinity. Mm -hmm. My opinion is that the doctrine of the Trinity should be a theologumenon. It should be a matter of disputable opinion. You know, just like people can disagree about free will and predestination, or people can disagree about, you know, eschatological issues. I think the doctrine of the Trinity should be considered a theologumenon, an opinion that you can have or you cannot have. And it, you know, whatever, you're still a Christian either way. It's just something people are curious about. So I'm not saying that we should all reject the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm saying that it should not be this, it should not have the status of a dogma. Because just in general, it does not make any sense to have a dogma that by your own admission cannot be coherently formulated and nobody knows what we're talking about. That's not a dogma anymore. That's just a shibboleth. It's just saying, okay, if you're going to be a part of this group, you have to use these words. You know, maybe some people just have this intuition. No, I think actually there is something here. There is something in Trinitarian theology. It seems hermeneutically fruitful. It seems religiously and spiritually fruitful. There's something here. I think it's worth preserving. Okay, you don't have to abandon it. But you should not make it a dogma. You should not make it the boundary line between heresy and, and orthodoxy. You should not make it the point between Christian and non-Christian. Because there is not even a coherent statement of the doctrine of the Trinity to the present day. And it just seems to me entirely out of place to give it that much centrality for theology and that much centrality for spiritual life when it, you don't even know what you're saying. And nobody can say coherently what is being said. Yeah, or at least there's not a coherent and widely accepted view. I mean, the right. more educated you are about the subject, the more you're going to be finding that you're disagreeing with lots of other people. You know, I'm somebody that actively argues against the Trinity, any such Trinity theory on the basis of the New Testament teachings. But I do agree with what you said. Like, if this seems true to you, you have to follow Jesus. And I guess you're going to have to, for now, think this is true, right? I encourage you to reopen the issue at some point and notice some misfits between what you're thinking and scripture. But mm -hmm. I mean, I have to allow you as a fellow believer to follow your conscience and your own judgment. So I can't tie you up and say, I won't let you go until you uh, <laughs> deny the Trinity or something, right. or try to pass a law against it. I respect it in that you have this theory that you're constructing and you're trying to make sense of all the evidence. I think that's all great. It's, it's a sign of taking it all seriously. It's just that sometimes one's view of the evidence can flop around. You know, when you go through something like a paradigm shift, what seems obvious before on a certain set of assumptions or on a certain theoretical program that you're taking part in now just doesn't seem obvious at all. Right. And that's that's what happened to me through a lot of study and prayer. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. But I can't begrudge anybody else the same right to think through it at their own pace in their own way. You know, all I can do is say, hey, here's some arguments. I don't think they're begging the question. What do you think? Right. At the end of the day, it seems to me that, you know, my goal in, in my writings and, 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 you know, everything that I do is to call to a rational, cool-headed discussion about these things. And especially those things where it seems that it's very difficult to have a rational discussion. I think people should be honest about the difficulties inherent in the doctrines of the Trinity, of the Eucharist, of the Incarnation, of theological tradition. I think people should be honest about the status of these doctrines and, and not just resort to stereotypical formulas and, you know, the great tradition and the church fathers. These notions, in my opinion, crumble under the slightest bit of analytic weight. They are not actually coherent notions. They're actually, in my opinion, ideological tools and manipulative ideological tools for propagating a certain opinion. But, you know, maybe you can disagree with me about that, but at the very least, we should have a discussion. We should be able to talk openly about ideas and to call a spade a spade when we have to. And this is what I've tried to do now with you, Dale, talking about the Trinity. I want people to be honest about the actual intellectual difficulties of a doctrine of the Trinity. I don't want them to just take it for granted as obviously essential to the Christian faith. I don't want them to take it for granted that there is some one such thing as a doctrine of the Trinity when clearly there isn't. 
beyond perhaps a verbal formula. I want people to be able to speak honestly about these things and to adjust their behavior towards others and their theological, you know, the odium theologicum, as it's called, towards other people in light of the actual evidence that we have and in light of how confident we can actually take ourselves to be in some of these things that become causes of conflict between people. Now, I think some people, Dr. Nemish, listening to what you're saying, would tell themselves that you've gone soft, you've gone liberal, you're too tolerant, you know, we need more calling a spade a spade. And I run into people all the time who think that apologetics is largely a matter of trash talking and trying to belittle the heretics. And they don't really get much into argument. Oh, you know, you and your fancy pants, rationalistic assumptions here, you just think all these things can be argued, but we just think they should be directly confronted. But I, I think you're following scripture here. And I think I'd like to end by reading a little passage from the letter by James in the New Testament, chapter three. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such, quote, wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Argument in the philosophical sense, rational, friendly, respectful argument, that's the only way forward. These apologists who just think that it's a matter of bullying are not acting as part of God's kingdom, basically. Right. There's nothing rationalistic or modern about the attitude that you're recommending at all. It's as old school as it gets. No, absolutely. You know, I would say I am not an apologist. I'm a theologian. I'm somebody who tries to engage in reasoned discourse or logos about God and about everything as as far as it's related to God. And it seems to me that the way to do that is to try to consider the evidence as fairly and as objectively as possible, to consider objections, to hear alternative explanations and interpretations, and to be a calm person in doing all of this. It seems to me that's the way to behave rationally and, you know, simply to shout other people down and to propagate my ideas by force and so on. Leave to the side the fact that that's not scriptural, you know, wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Leave the scriptural part to the side. Even people who are non-Christians can appreciate the difference between somebody who's a loud mouth and somebody who's willing to talk about an issue calmly. Mm -hmm. Even people who do not have the Spirit of God can see the difference and appreciate one over the other. I think it's another peculiar fact that people you know, would take themselves to be fighting on God's side can nevertheless be obviously misbehaving mm-hmm. to Christians and to non-Christians alike. I think this is a very sad fact about life. You know, the people who take themselves to be on God's side and people who take themselves to be doing God a favor can actually be making things far worse and, and be behaving badly. Well said. Dr. Nemish, thanks for talking with us. Thank you. Be sure to check out the two blog posts for these episodes at trinities.org, which contain a bunch of links to Dr. Nemish's work and to various things that we discussed in these episodes. This week's thinking music has been the track La Bella, or La Bella, by Mr. Smith. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org, where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.com.
www.thepeacekeepers.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>